midst of our little series for this summer called Peter, the Friend of Jesus. And this one, obviously, is Peter Denied Knowing the Arrested Jesus. That's the title today. And our theme is going to be Acknowledge Your Actions. Uh, Have you ever been to the source of disappointment for a family member? Have you ever let a close friend down? Have you ever betrayed the trust of a friend? What about turning your back on an authority figure for the sake of self-preservation? Like, ouch, Pastor Jason, how could you start out a sermon with questions like that, right? Truth is, we don't like to explore uh, questions like this. We prefer those questions to be turned a little bit and, and, and posed a bit differently. Like, hey, has a family member ever disappointed you? Or has a close friend ever let you down? Has a friend ever betrayed your trust? Or has an authority figure ever put you in a tough situation? Totally different questions that invoke in us two very different emotional and spiritual responses. I I believe that as a Christian culture, we hear a lot about how to respond when we are sinned against. But we hear very little about what to do when the Spirit reveals to us that we are the ones who have sinned. And this is the angle that I believe uh, the Word of God takes us this morning. Last week, Pastor Tim said the Gospels are primarily about Jesus, that each story is meant to reveal something about the character uh, of Jesus that we need to know, and this is very true. Uh, However, I don't think that the story of Peter denying Jesus is as much about Jesus as it is about Peter. I say that delicately because, like I said, every story in the Bible teaches us something about the nature and character of God in his son, Jesus. And and we will look at Jesus' response to Peter in this tragic story, but the focus of this episode is on Peter's heart-wrenching failure and sin. He denied his friend, his Savior, and his Lord. And it's a story of how Peter responded to his failure and to his sin. You see, I did not anticipate this sermon uh, would go in the direction that it did. And the more I got into it and the more I prepared, uh, the more difficult it was to write. Truth is, one of the realities and responsibilities of preaching to you each and every week is this, that every Sunday, by the time I step into this podium, I've had a heart-to-heart with God all week long. God's Spirit, through His Word, works on my heart during the week as I prepare And this is one of the things a pastor is called to do. And I must allow the light of God's Word to shine its spotlight into my heart first before I can deliver God's Word to you. Then, with that spiritual work fresh in my mind, my goal each week is not to preach at you, but to lead you where God's Spirit has already led me. You know, as a pastor and congregation, we grow together in our relationship with Jesus just like Peter and the disciples did. And I am growing spiritually, emotionally, some would say physically, uh, as I'm learning through fits and starts, failures and successes more about Jesus and the gracious, uh, glorious grace of being in a relationship with him as your pastor. And I learn from him and from all of you. And you all learn from him and, and hopefully from me as well. And we're all growing in grace together. And we are growing in our knowledge and love of Jesus together. We're growing in this relationship with him together. And so with that background and those questions at the beginning in mind, we're going to take a look at this emotionally charged episode in the relationship between Peter and Jesus. This is a a significant uh, episode in their lives that, that basically set the tone for the rest of Peter's life. And today we're going to put ourselves in Peter's shoes and look at these uh, few moments in his life through his eyes. So we're at our first point, Peter's disheartening conversation. So we're in Luke 22. I'm going to read verse 31 and following again. Peter is, or Jesus is talking to the disciples and he, he singles out Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. So Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan demanded to have you so that he could sift you like wheat. To sift like wheat is a metaphor uh, that would be akin nowadays to the metaphor like pick you apart piece by piece. Right? You ever hear that one? So Satan wants to pick you apart piece by piece. And, and the two instances of the word you used in verse 31 are both plural. So Jesus is talking about all of them, kind of like y'all. So Satan was demanding 
that Jesus allow him to pick apart the group of disciples piece by piece, is what uh, Jesus is saying there, which doesn't make this statement any less intense. Because who wants to be separated from friends and colleagues by Satan and then be left alone at the mercy of, or lack of it, of Satan, right? Not me. (laughs) I'm sure the disciples weren't game for that either. But this is Satan's strategy, to divide and to conquer. He will always work to divide the church so that he can conquer individuals one-on-one. That's why the message of 1 Corinthians is so important. It is vital that we be a community that is focused on the gospel and operating upon the humble, selfless, sacrificial premise of the gospel of Jesus, striving to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Because Satan is walking around like a roaring lion, seeking people to devour. He begins by picking people off one by one through division. And the Bible warns us that we're not to be ignorant of this tactic of our enemy. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on just that one verse, but Jesus goes on. He says, But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And, and the word for you in verse 32 is no longer plural, but now it's singular. So Peter, uh, Jesus focuses attention on Peter and from them all to Peter. And he says, and, and look what Jesus says to him. He says, I prayed for you. Now think about that a second. We sing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear, What a Privilege to Carry Everything to God in Prayer. I'd never thought of the verse of that song in reference to Jesus carrying our burdens to God in prayer. But the truth is, Jesus does pray for us, and he considers it a privilege to do so. If you ever think that you are alone and unheard or not understood, remember this verse. Jesus prayed for Peter's faith not to fail. That is one of the prayers that Jesus prays for you. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. He says, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes or prays for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit also prays for us with knowledge of our weaknesses and our shortcomings, and he speaks to God the Father on our behalf. He prays that God would give us the strength and the will to live according to God's word. And he's, Jesus has been in our shoes. Jesus, too, knows that we are weak and faithless, prone to stumble and easily thrown into doubt. And that is why he himself is at the right hand of God making intercession for us, Romans 8, 34. So remember this. Jesus is your Savior, but he's also your intercessor, praying for you at all times. Back to the story. Peter, feeling the adrenaline rush and the loyalty for Jesus uh, surge through him, he responds really quickly, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. In a sense, he's like, hey, Jesus, I don't need your prayers. I'm already committed. I'll go with you to the grave. I got this. I'm with you. In fact, the Apostle John remembered this moment uh, with these few, a few more details added. John records Peter as saying, I will lay down my life for you. Apparently, Peter thought he was ready to die for Jesus. But John continues, and Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Right? I can feel the tension right there. You could cut it with a knife. The pride of Peter and the compassion of Jesus. Je- Peter's like understanding of what the situation is and Jesus' completely sovereign understanding of what's going to happen, right? Peter couldn't fathom the Messiah dying. So he was willing to die instead of Jesus. And Jesus answered, The reality is, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. That had to have stung. That didn't sound like a very nice thing for Jesus to say to Peter when he just said that he'd be willing to die for him. Jesus completely contradicted Peter, calling his character and his loyalty into question. And I wonder if this comment made Peter a little bit afraid, right? Like, Jesus is always right. Jesus never made a mistake, and he had proven that he was all-knowing. And, but if I was Peter, I'd be asking myself, how could this be? Right? He's calling me a liar. 
I mean, I simply know that I'm not turning my back on him. I've been with him through thick and thin for three years. I left my boats and fish behind. I walked on water with this guy. I handed out food to 5,000 people. I've seen him in his glory with my own eyes, and I heard the voice of God from heaven with my own ears. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, I, uh, that he is the Son of God, and there's no way that I'm going to die that I know him. I don't know how disheartening Jesus' statement to him was because Scripture doesn't say but I can imagine this being pretty discouraging in this moment. I'm sure we've all been there. You've had someone that you are close to say something that really hurt. It was downright false, and like the person was questioning your integrity, your loyalty. And you're stuck in that awkward moment, right? Do you defend yourself? Do you argue the fact that you think they're wrong? Do you remind them that they could not possibly know your thoughts or your motives? Imagine having that feeling after Jesus said something to you. Like, holy smokes, how Peter ever recovered from this moment actually blows my mind, and I think that is what makes the rest of this story so emotionally difficult to read. It's so much like real life. Because look at what happens a few hours later, verse 54. Peter's difficult predicament. So they seized him and led him away, that's Jesus, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, uh, Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. So here's the setting. Uh, John, in his gospel, uh, describes the events that lead up to this point in time in this way. I'm just going to read from the Gospel of John. He says, So Judas, remember Judas was the one who betrayed him, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went to the garden with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing that all would happen to him, he came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. So we asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these other men go. Now listen. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Lord has given to me? The worst case scenario was unfolding right before their eyes. Have you ever wondered what you would do if they came to get you? Right? Peter was prepared. He wasn't letting anyone take him into custody if he could help it, right? And no one was going to lay a hand on Jesus either. And so he reacted in self-defense, self-preservation, and out of love and loyalty for Jesus. And he cuts off the guy's ear, right? He's probably going for his head. But Jesus stopped him. And right there, Peter gets scolded by Jesus again. Again, put yourself in Peter's shoes, right? Jesus scolds you for defending him. You stand there and you watch Jesus heal the man by putting his ear back on in place, and, and no one around you uh, seems to comprehend that Jesus just helped his enemy, that the very one taking him into custody was healed, seemingly for no reason, and he was being taken in custody for no reason at all. All you were trying to do was help Jesus, and you got your hand slapped. So you back off, you sheath your sword, and you watch, right? Jesus is taken into custody. He's led away to the place where they're going to conduct his trial. Jesus most likely has his hands bound with chains. He's surrounded by a band of soldiers, swords, clubs, torches, all that. And so here you are, following at a distance, making sure you can see what's happening, but staying at a safe distance where you could run if need be. Self-preservation, self-protection, Besides, Jesus just said to put your sword away. 
What are you supposed to do? Right? You're confused. How would Jesus have you act right now? Have you ever been there? Jesus, what do you want me to do right now? Right? Well, everyone arrives at the courtyard. You slip in a few minutes later. You stand awkwardly in the shadows, and then some folks kindle a fire in the middle of the courtyard. The fire is warm. It's inviting. And so you go over to the fire to warm up a little bit. You're shivering from the cold of the night, but also because the adrenaline is still is beginning to fade out of your, out of your body, and you, your heart's still pounding a little bit. You have the cold sweats, and you're nervous as can be, and so you sit down and warm your hands by the fire. Servant girl approaches you because you're sitting in the light of the fire. Why did you do that, right? You're like, hmm. And of course, she says something to you. She outs who you are. She says, hey, this man was with Jesus. And that adrenaline kicks in, right? Your heart jumps to your throat. Your stomach drops to your knees. Your ears begin to ring. Your mouth goes dry. You act instinctually. Woman, and you have so many thoughts going through your head, right? I don't know him. She shrugs, gives you that, I'm not so certain you're telling the truth look. (laughs) But she backs away. Good, now just remain in a low profile for a while longer. Your hands are still shaking. You put them in your pockets. You're, like, you want to step away a little bit, right? A little bit later, someone else sees you at the fire. You thought this dreadful interrogation was over, but here you are again, and they say, you are one of the disciples. And you look around, and you realize that you're outnumbered, that you are vulnerable in this spot. Again, panic rises in your body. You act instinctually out of self-preservation. Man, I am not one of them. Okay, sorry, didn't mean to upset you. Things calm down again, you calm down again. About an hour passes by, Luke says, and another person comes to the fire, sits down, looks around at everybody, scans your face, does a double take, right? This individual is insistent. I'm almost certain this man was one of them. He's a Galilean, right? I saw him with Jesus. And by now, you're exhausted. It's wee hours of the morning, you're cold, the adrenaline has been coming and going back and forth, you're stiff, you're sore, and then the panic sets in again with a new barrage of questions, and again, you're just done with this, right? Jesus scolded you for using a sword. You watch Jesus get taken away, not even do anything to protect or defend himself. You're convinced that you just have to stay alive or out of prison, whatever it is, so that you can help Jesus somehow. You don't know how you're supposed to act, and so you answer, man, I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't a flat-out denial. Peter didn't actually say, I don't know Jesus of Nazareth. I've never seen Jesus in my life. He just said, I don't know what you're talking about. He didn't actually say that, but he did deny that he was one of the disciples. Same thing. And I guess that we've all had the thoughts of grandiosity, right? Like, there's no way on earth that we would be ashamed of the fact that we believe in Jesus. We will boldly tell anyone and everyone that we are a Christian and that we love Jesus because he's done so much for us. And then we're faced with reality. We plan on telling that coworker about Jesus, but then there were other people in the lunchroom and we didn't want to embarrass ourselves or him. We plan on telling our family about how Jesus saved us and how he removed the desire for sin right out of our lives, but they were in a foul mood and combative. Or perhaps you were just minding your own business down at the local coffee shop waiting on your food when an old friend walks in from high school and says, hey, didn't you go, used to go to that church and believe in that guy, Jesus? And you don't know what to say. It's awkward. So you're like, nah, I don't remember that. I don't know what you're talking about. Peter's demoralizing realization. Look at verse 60. So Jesus, or Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, the roast, rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, I read those verses a couple dozen times that I prepared this message, and each time I shed a tear. Put yourself in that moment. You're sitting around the fire with people that you don't know. All you know about them is they're not people who have Jesus' best interests in mind. They're hostile to Jesus. They are his enemies. And because they're his enemies, they're also your enemies. And they didn't have your best interest in mind either. They're dangerous. And you're sitting there because you love Jesus and you want to be close to him and to see what's happening to him and to protect him. 
because you're his best friend. And that's what best friends do. And yet you just finished saying for the third time, I don't know, I don't know that man. And before the words are even out of your mouth, you hear the rooster crow. Your heart skips a beat, your stomach tightens to a knot, and you stop breathing because you remember. And before you can even think another thought, out of the corner of your eye, you see Jesus turn and he looks at you. And he locks eyes with you. And you can see the pain in his eyes. And you notice the disappointment and sadness in his countenance. And Luke is the only gospel author to include this piece of information that Jesus looked at Peter. I think it's incredibly insightful. But it's a painful statement. It would have been one thing to just be there alone, separate from Jesus, out of earshot, deny him, hear the rooster crow, and be reminded that he predicted that you would do that and then, you know, that you would fall away from him. But it's another thing altogether to be there within sight of Jesus, within earshot of Jesus, and to deny him, and it's implied that Jesus heard it. And then to hear the rooster crow, which means Jesus heard it too. And then to watch Jesus turn and look into your eyes with disappointment, sadness, and pain. There ain't no hiding it, no denying that you just did it, no rationalizing it. Jesus saw it and he heard it all. You're caught redheaded. And you recall how Jesus said to you, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. I need to pause here for a second. Here's a question that troubled me for quite a while. Did Jesus' prayer not get answered? Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail, but it did. Get that. Jesus, God Almighty, prayed that Peter's faith would not fail, and it did. Take heart, those of you whose prayers have not been answered like you hoped they would. Jesus himself has been there. A couple of times, actually, because just a few hours earlier, while in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was on the ground, on his face, praying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of suffering from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And God didn't remove the cup of suffering from Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus' prayer to relieve his suffering and his prayer to supply his best friend with the faith enough to endure were not answered as he requested. Jesus' prayers were not answered in the moment. And that's the key. Jesus needed to endure suffering and death so that he could save us. God had a greater objective and and the suffering was necessary as part of that. And Peter needed to fail at this point in time so that later he wouldn't do it again when the stakes were higher. God sees everything from the perspective of eternity, and he is always playing the long game. He answers our prayers, but not in the way that we anticipate. He answers according to his will, not according to ours. Because the reality is that God wanted, they needed Peter to go through this situation so he could learn that no amount of human resolve is going to keep someone from doubting or denying their Savior and Lord and best friend, Jesus. The strength to remain faithful is absolutely a work of the Holy Spirit of God. The ability to be loyal to Jesus is a grace given by the Spirit of God. Strength to be loyal is received from Him. And it's not something that we can conjure up by ourselves. Peter's a great example of that. And Peter's life after this devastating moment demonstrates this truth. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, it says that Peter was filled with the Spirit of God and then he preached a sermon that convicted over 3,000 people who all repented and believed in Jesus. Spirit first, then he acted. In Acts 4, it says that Peter was taken into custody just like Jesus was and accused of things that could bring him the death penalty just like Jesus was. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it says that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, then said, and Peter looked at the crowd of his enemies and he boldly accuses them of killing Jesus, and then he graciously offers them the gift of salvation through belief in the risen Lord. Now, how could Peter do that? How could he offer grace and forgiveness and salvation in Jesus' name to the very people who had murdered his friend and now were about to murder him? What happened to the guy who cut off the other guy's ear, right? That was Peter in the first place. He was changed. The Spirit of God strengthened him to be like Jesus, to love his enemies. 
And next week we will see how he was changed. Even after his three denials, Jesus graciously offered Peter the same invitation he did at the beginning. Follow me. And then Peter accepted the invitation with the perspective-giving and humbling scar of having disappointed Jesus and never wanting to go back there again. So back to Luke 22. Jesus looks at you. You remember Jesus' prayer that your faith will not fail. You recall his challenge, which seemed strange at the time, to, to strengthen your brothers when you returned. And, and then you remember Jesus' dreadful statement directly to you. Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows this morning. Peter, you will fail me. And it came true. Despite all your best intentions, despite your incredibly strong will and your stubborn character, despite your faithful loyalty and love for Jesus, despite your strong friendship and love, despite the sword in your sheath, truth is you just denied that you knew him. Like, ugh. But this last verse is the saving grace. Peter may have been a blockhead, but he had a soft heart. He may have been called a rock, but he was moldable clay. Peter knew what he did. He didn't protest. He didn't rationalize. He didn't finger point. He didn't blame his circumstances or his upbringing. He didn't drag the other disciples into it saying, hey, where were they? He didn't blame God for not answering Jesus' prayer. Peter simply went out and he wept bitterly. I'm sure he was ashamed. I'm sure he was disappointed with himself. I'm, I'm sure he was grieving the potential loss of his friendship. On top of that, he knew his friend was going to be murdered and die. And so, I'm sure he was frustrated that this was the last thing that Jesus would hear from him before he was murdered. And Peter wept bitterly. The word can also mean violently. Those of us from the States are fairly reserved when it comes to grief. I remember my first encounter with death in the village overseas. I didn't know what to do with what I saw and heard. I had no category for it, absolutely none. The mourning and weeping was so bitter and violent, and the bereaved wailed and moaned while writhing on the ground in so much pain. And Peter most likely wailed and moaned while writhing on the ground, regretting his sin. Against his friend, his Savior, his God, his Messiah, he failed. But he knew he failed. He owned it. He took responsibility for what he did. He acknowledged his actions. He wept in repentance and in remorse. And by the grace of Jesus, he never did it again. And as we sit on this story, letting the emotion and the tension of it rest in our minds, I want to thank God for putting this story in his word. He didn't have to. You ever want to, like, God chose that story. And Peter didn't have to share this humiliating story with anybody, but he did. The Spirit of God could have left it out, but he didn't. Peter acknowledged his actions. And then Peter told this story so Luke could record it. And God left this story for us because every now and then we need to be reminded of a few things. One, we're weaker than we think. Two, that though we are saved by grace, we have the capacity to fail. Three, we oftentimes don't even live up to our own expectations. And four, fourth, that there's no way we can fix our sinful hearts or the messes that we make. But God, being rich in mercy. You see, the realization of our weakness and our sinfulness can cause us to wallow in despair or it can cause us to worship God by the grace of Jesus. Acknowledging our actions brings us to the end of ourselves and allows the loving and gracious forgiveness of Jesus to take over. Understanding and resting in the unfathomable grace of God destroys our despair because the truth is the grace of God is what saves us from our sin as we trust in his death and his resurrection by faith. The grace of God through Jesus Christ meets us in our worst moments and reveals his forgiving, loving kindness to us. The grace of God takes our failures and recreates them into motivating memories of grace. You see, this is not the end of the line for Peter. He wasn't 
discarded by Jesus because he sinned and failed him. He wasn't forsaken because he denied Jesus. Because Peter's repentance and faith, Jesus restored him. Just like our friend Adam two weeks ago, when he came and testified about himself and the end of his striving while he's sitting in solitary confinement in the prison, that's when the grace of Jesus saved him and renewed him. And I loved his line, I didn't find God as if God were lost. He found me and he saved me. Next week, we're going to finish this series with the the next significant encounter between Jesus and Peter. It's when Jesus found Peter in a fishing boat again, of all places. But instead of condemning Peter, he made him breakfast and broke bread with him on the seashore. (laughs) It was a personal and honest encounter with Jesus. And when Jesus looked at Peter and asked him three times, do you love me? And Jesus in grace and love completely redeems that tragic story. The grace of Jesus took Peter's failure and he recreated it into a motivating memory of God's grace. Peter the denier is one of the first people that Jesus revealed himself to after he rose from the dead. Isn't that awesome? Peter, the one who failed to live up to his own expectations, is the first one that Jesus restored, confirmed, strengthened, and established as his man, chosen for the important position that he had in building the kingdom of God. And why? Because Peter owned it. He recognized and acknowledged his actions. And though Peter believed that Jesus was the Messiah and said that he was willing to die for him in weakness, Peter doubted and failed his friend. And yet when confronted with his failure, he humbly admitted he was a sinner and he repented, falling upon the gracious, loving kindness of his best friend and Savior. And Jesus forgave. And born from that painful experience, I want you to listen to what Peter, the denier of Jesus, writes to believers in the first century, who were faced with persecution and execution for claiming that they knew Jesus. Okay? These believers would be tempted to deny Jesus just like he had because they were experiencing the terror and the fear, the anxiety and the temptation for self-preservation that Peter faced on that horribly dark night. Now listen, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter writes this out of this experience. Beloved, do not be surprised the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, wow, rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And now I want you to listen to Peter's final encouragement to all of us with strong echoes of what Jesus prayed for him as he wraps up his letter in chapter 5, verse 6. 1 Peter 5, 6. Peter says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded and watchful. Get this. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Remember, Jesus said, he said, Satan demands to have you. Peter says, resist him, the devil, firm in your faith. Jesus did what? He said, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Remember, Jesus is praying for you even now. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for keeping that story in your word. Boy, that took some humility of Peter to admit that story. And thank you for what we can learn from it. I don't know where each and every individual is here today and how your spirit is speaking to each heart. There's so many different things that 
he could be saying. And I just pray that he'll have free reign in our, in our hearts right now. God, that you would convict us of things we may need to, to repent of. And Lord, if we've turned our back on you or we've done something that would be displeasing to you, just convict us of that. And then God, just may we just repent and weep and allow you to fix it. May we fall upon your grace. May we run to you again and again and again. Because your mercy is calling out. And your mercy is new every morning. And your grace is so sufficient. And it will always save and it will always renew and it will redeem. And God, we have nothing but you. Ah, we love you. So be with us this week, Father, as we contemplate this story. May it seek deep into our hearts and as we look forward to next week when we read about Jesus renewing this, this tragedy and making it something that was motivating for grace and for love and for, for your kingdom. God, we look forward to next week's message and as we contemplate the gracious, loving kindness of Jesus. Thank you for him. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.